Earlier today, Columbia Business School professor Charles Colomiris was here on Bloomberg Television, and he said there's, quote, no accountability, no transparency on these stress tests. The regulators are going to do things in an invisible dome. Do the markets believe these tests are credible? I think they do. They're, they particularly believe they're a lot more credible, at least here in the United States, relative to Europe. Europe has really struggled in terms of the, the validity of their stress tests, if you will. But certainly, if you look back at a year ago in the so-called Armageddon scenario that yes. they put forth, this year becoming a lot more robust, a lot more qualitative uh, aspects, if you will, there's a lot of validity in terms of what's coming out. The problem is the transparency as it relates to the banks, how the Fed is actually viewing this material. Okay, so if you were determining the criteria that the Fed uses to measure up these banks, to deliver these stress tests, and to measure their capital adequacy, what would you do differently? What I would do differently, quite frankly, is make it more transparent. Yeah. In, in effect, you have to provide the institutions with, here are the analytical tools that we use at the Fed in terms of evaluating your adequacy, if you will. Okay. And so that they have an understanding and there's that dialogue that there's no surprises, so to speak, when it comes to releasing these tests. The size of the Fed's balance sheet, it's over $3 trillion right now. How does that impact how much money banks, at least now, should be required to have on hand? Well, it, it, it's certainly a growing concern, uh, with, without question. But for the time being, we have a very modest global economy in terms of the growth aspect. And so right now, the, the global liquidity trade is very critical in terms of helping the, the, the various economies kind of pull out of whether it's a recession in Europe, here with the, uh, the lackluster growth. So on the one hand, we need that excess liquidity to yeah. help jumpstart. But at the end of the day, what's going to really move things along is the policymakers. Sure. We need fundamental change in policy to make progress. The Fed can only do so much. You're not the first person to talk about that need for structural reform. You were talking about Europe. Are derivatives of banks Achilles' heel, especially when it comes to accounting measures? Because, as you know, they're different between here and, and Europe. Absolutely. I mean, for the, for the time being, and, and for, actually for a number of years now, we've looked at derivatives as effectively a black box. It's very difficult to determine what the true underlying risk is with these particular uh, instruments. Well, it seems like some people have compared it to using a gross number versus using a net number. Right, exactly. And, and the banks, to this point in time, have largely just disclosed that gross number, sure. if you will. And, you know, y y there's a lot more to it in terms of the actual risk, if you will. These stress tests are going to be released uh, after the close of the markets today. Which banks might be the big winners? I think that really the big winners are the regional banks, quite frankly. Sure. They're the ones that currently hold the most capital. They've been very aggressive in distributing that capital. They have the higher capital ratios, if you will. Yeah. There's a pretty uh, clear understanding that each one of them is going to be granted an incremental higher capital distribution. Well, you have a buy on four banks. Which are they? They're Bank of America, mm -hmm. City, excuse me, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo are, are my, my top three in PNC. Tell us why. The uh, fundamental reason is the, these larger banks are really the most levered to an improving economy. By the same token, we're very comfortable with their capital levels. And then lastly, the valuations. We find them to be very inexpensive. A lot of the risks that we've, saw, we've seen in past years continues to evaporate. We're starting to see a little bit more visibility going forward. So we've become a lot more comfortable owning some of the strongest banks in, here in the U.S. Mr. Hagerman, we have a minute left. Uh, the results of this stress test, they're going to be released in two phases. Today, the look is how a bank could possibly handle another economic downturn. Next week, we are going to get a sense of how the banks would have performed if they'd spent some of their capital on share buybacks or paying higher dividends. Right. This extra week, I, I hate to draw this parallel, but it reminds me of the week that uh, between uh, when the playoffs are over and they have the extra week before they play the Super Bowl, right. there's a lot of tension. Is, does this create unnecessary volatility, this lag time? It has a potential, without question. And as you mentioned, this is a very simple uh, set of numbers that is coming out tonight. It's a very sure. static stress test. It's the Fed's own model. It doesn't have the input, if you will, from the banks themselves. It doesn't take into effect any proposed capital distributions. And quite frankly, it's very difficult for investors to extrapolate 
the numbers that are going to be released tonight in terms of what the actual results will be a week from now sure. in terms of what they're going to approve, what they're going to deny.